Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Aaron Friedberg. I'm the co-director of the Wilson School Center uh, for International Security Studies. Since 9-11, uh, more than at any other time in the post-war period, questions about the adequacy and the appropriateness of the performance of America's intelligence and counterintelligence agencies uh, have been at the center of domestic political debate. The discussion about the absence of warning before 9-11, uh, questions about the adequacy of intelligence regarding Iraq WMD, uh, treatment of detainees, uh, questions about electronic surveillance programs, debates over the estimates of the Iranian nuclear program, uh, and now controversies over Russian interference in the U.S. election and allegations of improper use of intercepted communications for political purposes. And our guest today was at the center of many uh, of these controversies, and he can offer a unique perspective on all of them. So it's a great honor for me uh, to be able to welcome General Michael Hayden to the Woodrow Wilson School uh, as director of the CIA from 2006 to 2009. General Hayden was responsible uh, for guiding the collection of information concerning America's adversaries, producing timely analysis for decision makers, overseeing the conduct of covert operations to thwart terrorists and enemies of the United States. Before becoming CIA director, General Hayden served as the country's first principal deputy director of national intelligence, uh, and he was the highest ranking intelligence officer in the armed forces. Prior to these assignments, General Hayden served as the commander of the Air Intelligence Agency, director of the Joint Command and Control Warfare Center, director of the National Security Agency, and chief of the Central Security uh, service. He currently is a principal at the Chertoff Group and the author of Playing to the Edge, American Intelligence in the Age of Terror. And if you are interested, books will be available for sale uh, in the lobby following the talk, although because of General T Hayden's tight schedule, uh, he has pre-signed them uh, and won't be sticking around to sign them. Uh, a final word of introduction. Uh, General Hayden uh, is a native of my hometown, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and is a loyal Steelers fan. I noticed in his book there were nine entries in the index of the Pittsburgh Steelers. So to me, that tells, uh, tells a lot. He's a man of great discernment and taste. Uh, please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming General Hayden to Princeton. Well, thanks for the opportunity to come and chat a little bit this evening. I think the order of march that's been given to me by Dr. Friedberg and, and, the, and the dean is I get to transmit for 30, 35 minutes, and then we all get to have a generalized discussion and scrum, and, and you can go ahead and ask questions, and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. And frankly, I'm more looking forward to the back half than the first half, because that's the part where I actually learn stuff from, from your comments and observations, so thanks. I'm going to talk a little bit about the book. All right, because I think it's a good framework to, to actually talk about some of the issues uh, that the, uh, the doctor has raised. All right, and, and the book's out for about a year now. Um, uh, I've been doing some recent rounds on Bill Maher and, and, and Colbert's show because uh, Random House has pushed out the paperback edition. All right, so, but the, the hardback came out about a year ago. And then I, I did the usual thing for, for all the tours. And, and in, in the presentation, being an Air Force officer, I had three main points. You only get to make three in the Air Force. And it was, why did I do this? Uh, what's in the book? And, and then the last thing was, how does a former director of this and that get to write a book about that and this? All right? I've actually changed that format. You, you're still going to get the, why did I do this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a, a bit about what is in the book. But rather than talking about how, which is fundamentally a, a humorous but not overly compelling story about getting stuff cleared through the American bureaucracy, uh, it's going to be what now, all right? And how some of the things I, I try to reflect in the book now seem to be even more pertinent or more related even to, to recent events, all right? So let me, let, me start, let me start with why. Why did I write the book? I, I, I actually teach now. I've been at George Mason since I left government at the uh, Shar School of Policy and Government. And, and for, for most of the time, I, I teach a course uh, called Intelligence and Policy. And occasionally, I'll mix it up. I'll do one about global problems. And then uh, I, I, have a, I have actually taught one course on American espionage and popular culture. 
all right? which, which actually was, I, I had a great deal of fun, you know, where I'd play season one, episode one of Homeland, all right? <laughs> And then the lights would come up, and I would turn to Jose Rodriguez, the head of operations for CIA, and John Rizzo, his lawyer, and say, so what would you guys think of that? And you get the yin and the yang of the Hollywood version and the, uh, the real world version. But in the basic course, the one I've taught almost every semester, intelligence and policy, I begin literally at the me level of, of metaphysics. I actually begin with Plato's parable of the cave. All right, and think back, okay, yeah, you know, the fire, the cave, their chain, they can't turn, the shadows, the voices. Is the pursuit of knowledge worthy? Can, can we learn? And I, I, I know the Greeks were talking about philosophical knowledge, but I, I just use it as, as knowledge. And I let the students kick that parable around for about 20 minutes, and they all agree with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Yes, the pursuit of knowledge is worthy. And then I said, okay, good. What about the secret pursuit of secret truth? How about that? And they kicked that around for 10 minutes or so. And yeah, no, that's good too. Secret pursuit of secret truth. Now you can see I'm kind of setting them up and I'm, I'm narrowing it down. And I go, so is the secret pursuit of secret truth compatible with the American democracy? Or more broadly, is the secret pursuit of secret truth compatible with any modern Western valued democracy? And, they, I, and then I let them kick that around for for another five or 10 minutes. Now I'm here to report, I've been at George Mason eight years, most of the semesters I talk about this, so I've probably got a sample size of 12 or 13 classes, 50, uh, 25 to 30 students. I'm here to report that so far, 100% of my students, when asked, is the secret pursuit of secret truth compatible with American democracy, have answered in the affirmative when asked the question by the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, <laughs> who has ultimate control over their final grades. <laughs> and, and, and even that is part of the windup. And, and then I really get to the pitch. And here, I don't toss it and let them discuss it. I actually give them a premise. I say, let me do you one better. I think the secret pursuit of secret truth is not just compatible with our democracy. It is essential to our democracy. And, and I, I base the argument is simply on the reality that frightened people don't make good Democrats or Republicans, small d, small r in both cases. Frightened people begin to gnaw on their neighbors' rights and privacies and liberties. And when they get really good and scared, they don't mind gnawing on their own rights and liberties and, and privacies. And so I talk about successful espionage not being just about the defense of American security, but about, about the defense of American liberty. So I was director of NSA on 9-11. And on 9-13, two days afterwards, I addressed the entire um, NSA workforce. I mean, actually, I was talking to a camera like this, but NSA being NSA, we, we were beaming it out to all 35,000 workstations, which was the actual population of the agency. It's really quite large and really quite global. And, 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 and the speech was pretty much what you'd expect me to say. Uh, number one, uh, you know, uh, it's good you're here. You're doing your duty. Because I mean, I'd actually heard you know, the tensions of the time. Um, that, you know, some folks have been, had family members throwing their bodies across the front end of the car saying, don't go, don't go. I said, thanks for being here. Let me give you the good news. Uh, there are more than 300 million of your countrymen who wish they had your job today so that they could contribute something. I got a little tactical with them. I said, look, uh, job one now is still defense. We'll get to offense, but we're doing defense. Technically, it's called TWAA, threat, warning, attack, assessment. What happened? Why? Anything more in the pipe? We'll get to offense. Defense, defense. And then I ended up <clears throat> which with what I thought was the most important part of the talk, and I actually found the talk. I mean, I'm you know, doing research for the book. I actually found my notes, what I actually said that day. And in essence, what I said was, let me tell you what I think the big picture is. All right? Free peoples have always had to decide where in that spectrum, with liberty at one end and security at the other, privacy over here and safety over here, where they wanted to tuck their banner. And I said, look, we Americans, blessed blessed by two really big oceans, and, and frankly, two neighbors that were either weak and or friendly, all right? We have always tucked our, our banner way over here on the side of liberty and privacy. I said, point blank, frankly, that is now at risk. 
That is in danger because of the events of 48 hours ago. So, so our objective here at NSA is we're going to keep America free. And we're going to do it by making Americans feel safe again. And that was our, that was our broad tasking. Rarely has something, in my view, rarely has something so essential to American democracy been as mis or as ununderstood as American espionage has been to the broad American public. I mean, and, and unless you're a real groupie for the topic, I mean, you, I, digest um, stories about American ep, uh, espionage through Homeland and Zero Dark Thirty and Jack Bauer and, and Jack Ryan and, and, and Enemy of the State and, and Will Smith and, and, and so on. And I, and I just thought there was this, this gaping hole in terms of, of America's understanding of an enterprise of its government that I viewed to be not just legitimate but essential to the appropriate functioning of of that government. So, I mean, the, the purpose of the book is, is kind of, um, hey, come over here with me. I want to introduce you to some people. Uh, we're going to have to go through this door here. I'll, I'll punch in the code. You can't know the code. Uh, and we're going to go through the door. And I'm going to introduce you to some of these folks and the things that they do on your behalf. Um, in the preface to the book, in the foreword to the book, I talk about being at a place called Alice Springs, Australia. Alice, you're not, you, yeah, uh, Alice is in the middle of nowhere. It is in the middle of the continent. I mean, you land, you get on the road, okay? You drive out of the airport, you come to a T, Alice, 15 kilometers or something, Ayers Rock, 650. I mean, that's all there is out there. Um, I was at Alice, by, by the way, anybody who's got any experience in this profession, should be a little bit mildly surprised that I get to say Alice Springs in a public audience. It's one of the things that was kind of rolled back. It is a joint American-Australian facility. All right, our, our Aussie friends call it Pine Gap. We call it Alice for the, for the nearby town. We've got a lot of Americans there. They love it. They do great work. We were having a Five Eyes conference there. Uh, the Five Eyes, the, kind of the Anglo-Saxon bubbas who trace, trace their roots back to Bletchley Park or the similar activity in the Pacific ourselves, the Brits, the Canadians, the Kiwis, and the Aussies. And we were having a meeting there, <clears throat> and we were on the floor of the operations floor at, at Alice, and we came out into this brilliant outback sun, all right, and our eyes are, are adjusting to it. And I'm walking out with my Australian counterpart, and I turned to him and said, Steve, wouldn't you love to take your countrymen back there on the ops floor and show them what those kids are doing? And of course, Steve said, yeah. Well, that's the why. To the degree allowed by law and policy, I wanted to show you what goes on inside your espionage services. So that's the why. The what. Um, so <clears throat> the book is called uh, Playing to the Edge, American Intelligence in the Age of Terror. That's my, my wife, Janine, here. Um, so the title is hers. All right. So I get the manuscript done. I get it cleared. I, I told you I was going to spare you that story about how you have to get it cleared. I send the manuscript up to... Uh, Penguin Random House, they, they do what editors do, and then kind of wire back saying, we need a title. I said, title? You didn't say anything about title. And so we muddled over for a weekend. She had read every chapter in multiple drafts. And uh, finally, about Sunday afternoon, she says, your book, Playing to the Edge. Now, I need to tell you, the colon, that's mine, OK? <laughs> And the American intelligence and the age of terror, that's me too. But Janine's playing to the edge. So, so what's, what's the metaphor? Um, we talked about Pittsburgh. Uh, we rolled the hardback out February a year ago. They got David Martin of CBS News to do a piece for CBS Sunday morning. And we did it in the Steelwork practice facility on the south side. And so we were, we were on the south side of Pittsburgh in the indoor field at the Steelwork training facility. And the long in the long camera view, we're mic'd so you can hear us, but we've got this long camera view of, of myself and David Martin. We're walking along the sidelines with, with my right foot coming down, you know, maybe three or four inches from the sideline. And then David says, uh, so what's with the title of the book here? What, where, where does that come from? And, and, for, and frankly, what I say is, look, David, it, it's kind of like, look, you see this field? It is 120 yards that way. It is 66 and two thirds this way. And all good athletes use all the grass. All good athletes use the entire field. 
It would make no more sense for us to, to refuse to use the entire field than it would for an NFL team to say, hey, uh, we've got we to be a little cautious this weekend. We're going to keep the ball inside the hash marks, all right? I mean, that's obviously a recipe for failure. I said, so by the way, David, uh, the Steelers don't determine it's 120 and 66 and two-thirds. That comes from the league office. And in my case, it's ultimately you, and, and, I, and I realize in a representative democracy, that's, that's a tortured and, and, and sometimes very indirect and sometimes unsatisfying process. But the line we get is the product of American law, the Constitution, American law, and, and American policy. And my pledge is that once we've been drawn that field, when the down and distance require it, to extend the football metaphor, when the circumstances demand, we will play all the way to the sidelines, all the way to the corner. We will use the entire field, even though we know when we do that, as surely as night follows day, we are going to be in an unpleasant congressional hearing sooner or later. Right? And, it, and it, will be, it will be sooner if we are successful and prevent the attack. Because folks will then be made to feel safe and wonder why we were so aggressive. Okay. Um, so that I could play back from the edge, avoid the congressional hearing, avoid, avoid the, the uh, rather harsh treatment in, in a major American newspaper, generally one on one or the other coast. All right? It's yet to appear in the Omaha World Herald or the Des Moines Register, these kinds of stories. But if I play back to avoid that unpleasantness, I may be defending me more nobly. I may be defending my agency, but I'm not defending you. And so, frankly, to the limits allowed by the Constitution, by the, by the law, and by policy, we're going to use the whole field. And we're going to do it unapologetically. And that's the reason for the, for the title. And, and frankly, the theme. Now, there's other stuff in the book. All right? But the core around which it's organized, if frankly, is, is already introduced, all of the controversial programs that have been rolled out since 9-11. And I, I should just tell you now, um, if you haven't yet read the book, uh, my fingerprints on every one that's controversial. I started the surveillance program at NSA. I inherited renditions, detentions, and interrogations at CIA. And although I modified them quite dramatically, I did not turn my back on my predecessors or condemn them, and in fact, continued aspects of the program. And frankly, the targeted killing program, you know, the drones, the predator stuff, was something that my agency um, forcefully urged upon President Bush in very late 2007 in the first half of 2008. Now, the book's not mean. I, I, I don't think it's judgmental, but I know it's not apologetic. It, it just lays out, here's what we thought, here's what we knew, here's what we thought we knew, and here's why we did what we did. So I talk about surveillance, all right? Uh, right after, uh, on 9-11, <clears throat> on 9-11, I made a decision about communications between Afghanistan and the United States, fully within my authority as director of NSA. Actually has to do with masking and unmasking, the word you've been hearing recently. Uh, I, I actually gave the analysts a little more, a little more running room, a little more space to unmask identities, in communications between Afghanistan and the United States. I did it, I did it on the afternoon of September 11th. Why? Because the circumstances had changed. The fulcrum, the balance between privacy and security had begun to shift. After all, we had just been attacked by an opposing armed enemy force that was headquartered in Afghanistan. I called George Tenet to let him know. I uh, told both congressional committees immediately. Uh, I said, I can come down and explain it to you. The Senate said, no, you're good. The House said, yeah, come on down, which I did. Tenet, George, the director of central intelligence, goes in, uh, goes into uh, one of his morning meetings with President Bush and lines out all the things he's doing. And then as George tells the story, says, oh, yeah, one more thing. Hayden, he's your guy at NSA. I think he's going to jail. Okay. <laughs> and, and Cheney then responds, tell him we got money. We'll bail him out. <laughs> okay. and, and the president said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, he's doing some stuff he wasn't doing before. I, I, I'm not sure I understand it. All right. And so, and the president just says, good. Is there anything more he could be doing? And so George goes back to Langley, and that morning he calls me. He said, my president, vice president, jail, bail you out, so on and so forth. Is there anything more you could be doing? I said, no, George, no, no, not, with my, not within my current authorities. Pause. That's not what I asked you, Mike. 
Is there anything more you could be doing? I said, I'll get back to you. And I huddled with my lawyers and my ops folks and said, well, there are some things we could do that would be more aggressive. It would kind of change that fulcrum, you know, security, liberty, uh, under the new circumstances. And within a couple of days, I'm briefing the president about it, and he authorized it. And we, we pressed on. Now, we called it stellar wind because stellar wind doesn't mean anything. That's how we name these things. Uh, the New York Times, when they finally revealed parts of it, called it domestic surveillance, which we strongly disagree with the adjective there. Uh, when it became a political issue, the right, White House labeled it the conveniently labeled terrorist surveillance program. You can see the political spin in that. By the way, uh, when President Obama was briefed on it, he hugged it like a teddy bear, too, and continued it. And it, it remained fairly steady. And there have been changes, and the law has been changed and all that. But uh, my validation is the guy who ran on not being George Bush, when he was briefed into the program, accepted most of the outlines of the program. So that's surveillance. Again, controversial. I get it. We can talk about it in the Q&A. Renditions, detentions, and interrogations. I didn't start it. I inherited it. When I got to CIA in the summer of 06, it was an 800-pound gorilla in the room. I, I spent the summer of 06 trying to master what it was my agency had done. Right? And by, the, by late summer, I was prepared to go in and tell the president, we can, we can change this program. All right? Uh, uh, not second-guessing George Tennis' decisions at all. Frankly, I probably would have made the same thing George did. But you know, that was 02. This is 06. I got a lot more penetrations of Al-Qaeda. I know more about these guys. I got a real better understanding of the level of threat. So I, we can throttle back, Mr. President. Now, by the way, Mr. President, we are, not, we are not your jailers. We're your intelligence service. We don't need to be keeping these people forever. Uh, I think we ought to empty our black sites, and we did. On Labor Day weekend, we took the last 14 prisoners we had and flew them to Guantanamo. We didn't close them. We kept them open, and you read the book. I put two more people in them later, but we, redu we reduced the population to zero, only put a couple more in, only kept them for a relatively short period of time. We took the techniques that had been outlined by George Tenet, 13, reduced them to six. And in fact, I convinced the president, and you probably, we probably need to tell more members of Congress what we've been doing, and you should probably make a public speech about it, which you did in September 2006. So we'll talk more about that specific. Uh, let me get to the third fingerprint, which is targeted killing. We spent early 2008 trying to convince the president that the strategic balance between ourselves and al-Qaeda had shifted. We, 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 were, we were pretty vociferous that we were, we were seeing Afghanistan pre-9-11 light in Pakistan, in the tribal region, All right, that we were seeing training camps, al-Qaeda al activity, people coming in to be trained, mostly Westerners who were being trained and then shipped back to, to the West, people up with the line we used with the president, people who would not have raised your attention had they been next to you in the, in the um, at JFK or at Newark or, or at Dulles. Uh, we were pretty insistent with the president. The line I'm going to tell you now is, is, is something we never said to President Bush. But if you'd taken everything we had said and said, OK, hey, you, get, you get 75 words or fewer to say it, this was a message. Mr. President, knowing what we know now, there will be no explaining our inaction after the next attack. And in early, early July, uh, the president really moved the dial on the rules of engagement for the United States to conduct targeted killings. And, and you saw the, the sharp increase from July forward in, in 08. You saw President Obama sustain that rate in 09 and then increase that rate in 10 and 11, not because he changed policy. He just had more kit coming online that allowed him to, to do uh, even even more of it. Again, I, I, I get the controversy, but if you, if you read the book, uh, you will find that what it was we said would happen if we did this happened. Uh, I had the good fortune, there was a court case in southern Manhattan uh, involving an Al-Qaeda affiliate, and um, as part of the court case, the, the American government made public a whole bunch of letters between bin Laden and some of his key lieutenants. And these letters talked about the dramatic effects of the drone campaign against them. And they were, they were, they, it did everything we wanted it to do. It disrupted. It, 
cut to the chase. They spent more time worrying about their survival than figuring out ways to threaten yours. And we really decapitated the Al-Qaeda leadership. And again, a program that despite the controversy, despite the politics, was embraced by, by a very different kind of administration because I think it was good for America. Look, there are a lot of other stuff in the book. I talk about a Syrian nuclear reactor in the eastern desert. I actually talked about it in a classroom not more than an hour or two ago that was finally destroyed by the uh, Israeli Air Force, but the discovery of it was a joint CIA-Mossad uh, activity. Uh, I, there's, a, there's a good chapter in the book that I really like called Espionage, Bureaucracy, and Family Life, <clears throat> in, in which I try to describe the burdens that this profession puts on the families of, of our officers. I, I talk about uh, an event there. CIA has a family day every September. It's the first Saturday after, uh, after Labor Day. Uh, and we open our campus up to the families of our officers. One bounce out, mom, dad, brother, sister, wife, husband, son, daughter, not extended family. But even with that limitation, the last couple of family days I officiated at, we had 20 to 25,000 people there. All right? and, and each of the offices tried to outdo one another. So you got, a, you got all, the, all the black SUVs up there in the front, and the kids climbed through it. You, you, got, the, you got the dogs. Um, one of the real popular displays for the little kids is uh, disguises. Okay, <laughs> So they, they get in line, and they get dolled up with beards and so on. Uh, one of the popular, one of the very popular stops for teenagers, so I don't think it's their choice, I think it's their parents who want them to experience this, is the polygraph station, okay? <laughs> and they bring, they bring the kids in. Uh, it is a wonderfully uplifting experience for someone like myself and Janine, director and, and, and spouse. Um, you do a little formal stuff at the beginning, but then after that, it's just kind of fair, you know, people just walking around. So we'll go to the cafeteria, which we've turned into kind of like a church Sunday picnic place, you know, uh, baked beans, uh, hot dogs, hamburgers, and, and so on. And we'll, we'll stop there, and someone will say, hey, Mr. Director, and you'll shake hands. And at that point, you are there for the next three hours as a, as a receiving line forms. And you, you get a chance to say hi to officers. There were, there were, two, there were two very distinct groups there. One, one was the 20-somethings. All right, who, who were bringing in tow mom and dad who had just driven up from Raleigh or flown in from Salt Lake, right? And, and mom and dad are clearly having an out-of-body experience as their son or daughter takes them through the Central Intelligence Agency. The other group, is a little bit smaller, were the 40-something officers who had a teenager or two in tow. And not infrequently, they would get to the front of the line, and Director Hayden, Mrs. Hayden, this is our daughter Margaret and our, 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 our son James, um, today, we told them where we work. Okay? I mean, cover, cover is a burden. Not, not, not everybody at CIA is covered, but some are. And you know, don't think they're gifting you if they tell you they work for CIA. They're giving you a burden. They've given you a secret now you must protect. So they can't even tell their children that they're CIA officers until the children have the maturity to protect the secret. All right? So it's 14-ish, 15-ish. Where, where the kids get told. And my wife, Janine, continually points out, oh, yeah, right when the teenagers are having all these trust issues, you get to tell them we've been lying to you for the last 14 years. Okay. Um, Janine leaned into, into, into one young lady and said, uh, so, you're, so your, your, mom works, your mom and dad work for CIA? Yeah, how does that make you feel? And she goes, my mom's a spy. <laughs> so... So I, I do try to put a human face on, on this activity. All right? There are a lot of other things in there, but you've got the basic themes of the what. Let me, let me press on to Roman numeral three, uh, the what now. All right? what, what, how, how do the things I, I have written about, uh, published a year ago for the first time, relate to, to what's, what's going on now? All right? So I've got two or three points I'll make rather briefly, but you know, have at me in, in the Q&A. Uh, the first is the relationship between American intelligence and the government it serves. The relationship between, let's say, CIA and, oh, the president. Okay? Uh, I don't know if you've been following along up here in New Jersey, but it's not been totally smooth. <laughs> okay? well, let me give you a take on that, all right? Because it, 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 that's a big deal, all right? The CIA exists only to make the president wiser and more effective, period. Um, there is, there is this existential thing 
So I'm going to get a little cartoonish, just bear with me, all right? There, there is this existential thing that has to do with the intel person and the policy person, or, or the intel person and the decision maker. For those of you with military experience, this applies to that canvas covered talk you served in in some sandy part of the world, the intel guy and the decision maker. But this model, we're talking about senior national intelligence figures president, the vice president, the national security advisor, all right? So in my little cartoon, I got the Oval Office here, all right? And I got two doors, and there are two doors. The intel guy comes in one door, the president comes in the other door. The intel guys, actually that's not technically right, but live with the cartoon, all right? So the intel guy comes through the door marked facts, okay? The president comes through the door marked vision. You know, the one you voted for him for, right? Vision. Fact, vision, world as it is, world as we want it to be. Okay? Fact, vision, as is, want to be, inherently inductive. I mean, the intelligence process is to collect as much as you can, synthesize, organize, present. It goes from the specific to the general, inherently inductive, sick, post-Newtonian, Bacon, Western thinking, inherently inductive. Inherently deductive. His or her primary task is to take that vision thing, those first principles, and apply them to a specific situation. Fact, vision, as is, want to be inductive, deductive, inherently pessimistic. It just comes with the job. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the Far East? Oh, North Korea's a problem. I mean, if it's we just naturally go to the negative. Bob Gates has a wonderful phrase. Bob, Secretary Gates was in my office before he was SecDef, right? Uh, Gage says, when a CIA analyst stops to smell the flowers, she looks around for the hearse, okay? <laughs> Inherently optimistic, or they would not have interviewed for the job with you, right? Fact, vision, as is, want to be, inductive, deductive, pessimistic, optimistic, always. And so you've got this, you've got this inherent gap to close because you, you, you do want to close and get into the mind of the president, but you can't become him. You, you, you can't become the people who come through that other door, otherwise you shouldn't be in the room. Your only license to be in the room is you're the fact-based world as it is, inductive, pessimistic person. So you can't break your tether, but you got to get into the head of the president. Now that varies by president, but it's a challenge with every president. I think it was a little easier with George W. than it, than it was with others, not, not because of any inherent quality of, of him, but his dad was, had my job, okay? I mean, his dad used to work in my office, so I think he kind of got a little coaching and mentoring on, on how this should work because his HW had been, but, it, but it's an issue, all right, with every president. And so you know that's always going to happen. I suspect the community going forward last summer with you know, only two horses left in the race said that with Secretary Clinton, it's gonna be a pretty easy lift because frankly, we had done that already with her. She had been Secretary of State for four years and that fact, vision, as is, that we pretty much worked that out. That had been a fairly easy transition. I also think that as Secretary Clinton might have been a less, a, a less difficult than average transition, everyone knew that a President Trump would be a higher than average difficult transition, right? Simply because all those things over here I told you about, the vision thing and all that, he took extra doses of those, okay? <laughs> And, and I mean this, I, I do mean this very respectfully, all right? This is a man who, who thinks intuitively, who has a, a almost preternatural confidence in his a priori judgments about how the world works, all right? Uh, instinctive in his reasoning, all right? And before any of us here in, in, in academia, myself included, get too judgmental, those are the instincts that made him president in the face of all the experts saying that ain't gonna happen. So we gotta give that a little space that he may know from time to time what he's talking about. So we always knew this was gonna be a little harder with a President Trump than, than average. It is a great American tragedy that this, this gap-filling exercise I told you was always gonna happen, it always happens, it was gonna really happen with this guy because it, it just comes from a different space. It is a great American tragedy that the issue on which we first attempted to resolve that gap, to close that gap, was an issue that was being used by some of our countrymen, not the intel guys, 
being used by some of our countrymen in order to challenge his legitimacy as president of the United States. But the first time we had, a, we had to bridge that gap was, was on the Russian interference in the American election. Now, that is a perfect storm and a really dark storm to boot. And we are still do, way down in the trough of, of that, that reality. And uh, we as a nation, he as a president, my tribe as a community needs to claw their way back out of the hole and get to a better equilibrium. So that's one kind of what now. Uh, another what now has to do with how much of what it is we do we should be telling you. So uh, you all remember the Edward Snowden thing, right? And all that stuff going out the door? Yeah. The, the first Edward Snowden story to really hit, and this was, this was not his design, it was Glenn Greenwald's and Bart Gell. It, it was the press guys to whom he gave the stuff. The first story they rolled out was something called the 215 program. All right, that's the metadata program. That's your phone bill sitting up at Fort Meade. Um, I started that October 2nd, 2001, George Bush, what more can you do, Hayden, all right? And it, it was pushed out the door, and, and there was a pretty strong public uproar, and frankly, the administration in my old agency, NSA, as my British friends would say, was really backfooted by, by it. And part of it was the administration really didn't want to roll up its sleeves and punch, punch back on this, because there there's actually de powerful defense for, for the program. I was on. Bob Schieffer, Meet the Press? No, Face the Nation, uh, Sunday morning. And uh, it was post Snowden and uh, metadata and, and how you doing and why you doing it and so on. And I was there talking. I got all done, we broke for commercial. Schieffer says to me, Mike, thanks for coming. That was really great. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. How come only the Bush guys are here defending the Obama program? Now, part of it is it started under Bush, but the other part of it was the Obama guys didn't want to go out. Another part of it for NSA was not just the kind of the political suppression, don't, don't go out and fight this so much. It was an assumption, I think, that this is going to be OK. So put aside the data, put aside the, the fact we were arguing about, and go back to process. NSA, I'm convinced, was of the belief, no, no, um, yeah, there, there, there's going to be a bad week or so, but everyone's going to get over this. And I'll tell you why. Because this has been approved by two presidents. Okay? President Bush approved it. President Obama approved it. Oh, by the way, it got legislated by Congress after I did it under presidential authority. It was later legislated by Congress. And oh, yeah, it is overseen by the two intelligence committees. In fact, they're fans of it. They're the strongest supporters of the program, even after Snowden made it public, were the chair and ranking members of the two intelligence committees. So it's approved by two presidents. It's legislated by Congress. It's overseen by the intelligence community. Committees, oh yeah, and the FISA court gets to look at it every 60 days, just make sure it's on, on an even keel. I mean, if you're sitting out of Fort Meade, you're going, hey, we're cool. That's the Madisonian trifecta. I got the executive, I got the legislative, I got your judicial. We are good to go. It is the formula that we decided on as a nation in the 1970s after the scandals of the early 70s, Church, Pike, and, and, and all those things, the Senate, House, Oversight Committees, and so on. Right? So NSA is thinking, all right, well, we're going to have a bad week here. But then people are going to realize, no, we did this just right. President, court, Congress, committees, oversight, we're going to be fine. And they weren't. Okay? A whole bunch of Americans, and <laughs> pardon me, don't, um, don't mean to be harsh, a whole bunch of Americans, not all of them wearing tinfoil on their heads, all right? A whole bunch of Americans, not way over here, way over here, but in here, a whole bunch of Americans said, you know what? I, I get that uh, Madisonian trifecta. I get Congress, of course. So yeah. But you, but you know what? I don't, I, I'm not convinced that constitutes consent of the government anymore. That might be consent of the governors. You may have told them, victim, all right? My life experience tells me it, it's, it's not the guys in the trenches doing this at all. This is done for political effect at a political level. Sir. Tim Vane on whistleblower. Yeah. Um, I would love your views on whistleblower. Do you think they have a role to play in democracy or on democracy? And my question would be more today. And if you would like to go in 20, 30 years as digital and numeric becomes even more what they are today. Yeah. Thank so, you. 
So yeah, I mean, the, the obvious answer is, yeah, whistleblowing is good because by definition, a whistleblower is blowing a whistle on something that should not be done, all right? So now, now I want to make it more complicated, all right? Edward Snowden is described as a whistleblower, all right? Edward Snowden's problem is he has yet to point out anything that was illegal, all right? He, he pointed out a bunch of things he didn't like. He pointed out a bunch of things that you may not like, but none of it was illegal. The 215 program, which, which was the, the big explosion, perfectly legal. In fact, it was never changed until Congress changed the law. All right? and, and so you, you, the, 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 phrase, the phrase is used in the public discourse for anyone who says anything he doesn't like. It, 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 a true whistleblower who courageously stands up and points out something that is inconsistent with law or policy, yeah, you, you've, you've, you've got to have that. And, and so, um, I, I don't know how anybody in my, with my history could say that's, that's not a good thing. Um, when I got to CIA, and this flies in the face of a little bit of my answer to you, when I got to CIA in the summer of 2006, May of 2006, uh, it was in the news a lot. And, and there were a series of leaks. To the degree they weren't from the top and political, they were probably coming from the Alumni Association. Uh, no, I'm serious, you know. Guys inside complain to guys outside Friday night at the bar. Guys outside talk to other, I mean, the story just kind of kind of percolates out. And so the first speech I gave to the agency was, and we're getting out of the news as subject or source. And my tool was not to make war on my own, for, my own workforce. My tool was to, com to create a completely open email process to me. And I had this flood of emails, and I answered every one of them, all right? And, and it, over time, they went down, and, and so did stories and comments about CIA in, in the press. So, so I, yeah, whistleblowers are good. But if you have a whistleblower, you already got a problem. You, you have not allowed the space for people to bring up these issues inside where you can actually act on them. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering, in addition to um, trying to solve the problems attendant to um, the current crisis with Russia, how much um, does the American intelligence community and the greater uh, national security community, um, how much is it considered um, the Russian problem as representing kind of a new reality and, and how have we taken steps to adapt to that new reality going yeah. forward? Yeah. So, so y'all hear the question, the Russian, okay. So um, we, we probably didn't pay sufficient attention to Russia for a while. Um, my wife's here with me. Uh, we traveled to more than 50 countries in, in 31 months as director of CIA. Not one of them was Russia, all right? We were, we were head down in the scope with proliferation, Iran, North Korea, terrorism. And institutions and human beings only have so much physical and psychic energy and we were really, really, really in, into that, all right? And, and so I, 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 I would actually say, not, not that my being more active, not my establishing some kind of relationship with the SVR, which I could have done. Uh, we had the Russian resident come once to CIA. He actually asked to come see us. This is the, the acknowledged Russian intelligence officer in the embassy in Washington. He, he, came, he came to my office. We had a very pleasant conversation. We thanked him for coming. He left. And then I brought the electronic team in immediately afterward and swept the office for bugs. <laughs> True story, all right? Um, probably probably a, an unforced error on my part to establish uh, more better relationships with the Russians. Now, the Russians uh, have come on strong. I, I, I left eight and a half years ago, all right? So I'm not taking full responsibility here. Um, here's my picture of Russia. I, I think it's accurate. This is not a resurgent power. It's a revanchist power. It's not resurgent. Uh, I was on Morning Joe a couple, uh, six, eight months ago after they did something we, we objected to. And we're about ready to cut to commercial. I said, Joe, can I say one more thing? Said, yeah, General, what do you got? I'm down in DC, he's up in New York. Yeah, General, what do you got? I said, Joe, you know all this stuff he's doing? Yeah, General. You know he's doing it, and he didn't have more than a pair of sevens in his hand, all right? Uh, it is not a strong hand. All right, um, everything you need to be somebody in the world today, they don't have. 
Right? When was the last time you bought a Russian product other than a Matryoshka doll or uh, you know, a, 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 handy, a handiwork? You know, buy a car from Russia? I mean, uh, they, are, they are a colonial economy colonized by other Russians. They are, they are an, who, who live in London, okay? <laughs> And it is an extraction economy. They're running out of entrepreneurship. Uh, the more and more the Russian economy is state-owned as each day goes by. They're out of democracy. They're not running out of oil and gas, but it's getting harder to get. It only costs $53 a barrel, so it's not very productive. And fundamentally, they're running out of Russians. This is a declining population, all right? And a little bit from the front end, birth rate, most from the back end, life expectancy, which is below that of the Soviet Union. The most primary causes of death for Russian males are violence, traffic accidents, accidents and substance abuse. How's that for a quality of life poster? All right? and, and so, Putin, so Putin, Putin won, says, I'm going to be autocratic, but don't worry. Mother Russia is going to be rich. And that was oil at 110. Then he had the Medvedev interlude. And Vladimir comes back for Putin, too. And he says, um, I'm going to be autocratic, but don't worry. Mother Russia is going to be proud. And he's staking his internal social contract, his internal validity, on redressing historic Russian grievances. The Donbass, Eastern Ukraine, Crimea, and Moldova, and, and, and other places. But he's doing it from a position of weakness. So it's going to be very interesting if the current president actually decides to strike back at his client, Bashar al-Assad, with a physical strike in Syria, which might actually have some merit, how that, how that plays. So my picture of Vladimir's approach is, and this is a cartoon, but it works, so bear with me. He's over here at the kitty table, all right? And all the big people over here are eating at the big people's table, and his chair no matter what he does, he can't make any bigger. I already told you about his limitations, right? But in order to continue his domestic validation, he's got to make Russia proud. He's got to make the Russians feel like they deserve to be at the big table. But he can't make his chair any bigger. He's got these limits. So every night, he goes over to the big table with his saw. And he goes there every night and cuts another inch or two off the table. In the great hope that if he cuts enough off the legs of that table. Someday he's going to slide his Russian little kitty chair over the big table, and it's going to look like it just fits perfectly. I told you it was a cartoon. Let me give you the punchline. That's his opposition to the EU. That's his trying to dissolve NATO. That's his support for breakfast, Brexit, and that's his messing around with American and European democratic processes. He wants to cut our institutions down to a level where he actually fits, and that's what he's trying to do. No. Sir. Um, I read someplace when you talked to Obama about Iran and the nuclear. Yeah. Um, he said he should look at it in a different way. It's about them trying to gain confidence and, yeah. and uh, yeah. intelligence. Yeah. Can you expound on that? Sure. So what this is referring to is a chapter in the book on Iran, uh, which is pretty interesting, although not very satisfying. It doesn't say. And then we, if we just did this, it would be fine. It actually ends up with a sentence that says, I don't think we'd have bought this deal. But then again, I don't know that we had a better idea. And that's how I end the chapter. So the reference here, I was, I was President Obama's CIA chief for three weeks. All right? I, he, 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 made the, he made the It Ain't Your Night Kid phone call in early January, all right? And said, uh, we're, we're going to make a change here. Uh, Leon Panetta's coming in. Uh, could you stay until Leon's confirmed? And of course, the answer to that is, of course, Mr. President-elect, we'll stay. So I am his chief for his first NSC meeting. And quite revealing, his first NSC meeting is on Iran. Right? So at the meeting, he turns to me and said, General, how much fissile material do the Iranians now have, LEU and HEU, right? low enriched and, and high enriched? And I turned to him, you're, you're suggesting the interlude. I turned and said, Mr. President, I actually know the answer to that one, but, but, can, I, but can I give you another way of looking at it? And I'll, I'll give you the answer in a minute. It doesn't matter how much LEU and HEU they have at Natanz. There isn't an electron or a neutron at Natanz that's ever going to be in a weapon. What they're building at Natanz is confidence. What they're building at Natanz is technology. When, when, when they go weaponization, they're going to do it somewhere else. And, and so what you need to be focused on is how good are they getting at it, not how much of the stuff have they stockpiled. All right, and that was the argument. 
which, by the way, if you take that all the way forward now to the nuclear deal, you can understand why I'm uncomfortable with it. Because the nuclear deal is based upon how much stuff they have, not how much technology they get confident in. And that's, that was the objection. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, early in the talk, you mentioned an increase in CIA ability to penetrate extremist groups. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what changed yeah. after 9-11 that let you do that. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it frankly, frankly is a, it is a function of time, all right? Um, Human intelligence gets you exquisite stuff, but it takes time to build the network, to build the, the guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who's willing to talk to the other guy. It, 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 is, it is time. We can, do, we can do it anyway, but it just takes time. Whereas signals intelligence, all right, you just say, all right, move the, move the feed horn this way. And the satellite responds, and now all that work you used to be doing over here, you're doing over here. Now, you, you got to do a little homework about the frequencies and who talks on what frequencies and so on. But signals intelligence is rapid, and you, you just turn it. Human intelligence just takes a lot of time. So now I'm in 2006, and I'd say, I know more about this, I know more about that, I know more about the other thing. I didn't do that. George did that because he began to invest in doing it. It happened again right after I left. So we're, we're beating the living daylights out of Al Qaeda in the tribal region with the uh, targeted killing program, all right? And we were always of the belief that they can't stand it, that they got to leave, and that they had, to, they had to go somewhere else. And the somewhere else we always figured was Yemen. All right? They didn't. They stayed there and died. All right? but, we, but we always believed in an operation like this, if you can make the enemy move, he is really vulnerable. And so the idea was if they begin to move, we, 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 can, you know, we, we get the closure. We, we, we more rapidly disintegrate the organization. They didn't. They, they stayed in Afghanistan. There was another, however, wholly separate organization that grew up in Yemen called AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So it wasn't a migration from the guys in the tribal region. It just started and moved up. That became apparent about 10, I guess, maybe, 11, maybe, right around in there. And I, I look from the outside looking in, but, but I, I can see the tempo of American operations where we know Al Qaeda and the Raven Peninsula is up and running, and we're talking about a lot, but we're doing nothing, we're doing nothing, we're doing nothing. And about 18 months in, bing, bing, we start, we start doing targeted killings. That's the clock. That's, that's the, the human network being developed in order to create the exquisite information that you need to do the other operational acts. So it, it's, it really is a function of time. Okay. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about the targeted killings versus the longer term, the longer term how we attack QAP, ISIS, these groups. I welcome this question. Please, so, like, go so ahead. So long as the underlying grievances right. remain there, You're groups back. like AQAP yep. and ISIS and yep. so on and so forth will continue to address them. So how does the United States um, where do we find the balance between short-term tactical killings versus long-term addressing underlying grievances? Thank God, you. God bless you for the question. So there is um, Showtime, uh, Spy Masters. Showtime had a special called Spy Masters. They interviewed every living director of CIA. Went all, all the way back to, to HW was on there. Um, Jimmy Carter's. Uh, director was on there. Uh, it was mostly about post 9-11 stuff, but they, but they interviewed all of us. And they interviewed me for nine hours, all right, two separate sessions, and they got everyone in the boat. Everyone agreed to talk, which is, this is not the most comfortable thing for a former CIA director to be asked questions with somebody else controlling cutting the film for, for after nine hours of in, interrogation. Uh, but we, we, all, we all finally went in. It's a wonderful piece. If you've not seen it, it's called Spy Masters. Those of you who kind of follow this kind of stuff, it's a bit like the Israeli film, The Gatekeepers, which is about heads of Shin Bet. And the theme, okay, someone said yes, yeah. It, the themes are, are, are roughly the same. They interviewed us separately. I had no idea what Tennant said, what Porter said, what Morrell said, I had no idea, all right? And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a montage at the end where they have every director who has been director since 9-11 saying one version or another is 
You know you can't kill your way out of this. You know you can't kill your way out of this. You know you can't kill your way. You know if you could kill our way out of this, we'd have had a parade 15 years ago, and right, right through. So all of us know you can't kill your way out of this. Um, remember that three weeks where I was uh, President Obama's chief? Um, on the margins of an NSC meeting, I, I got to uh, report, and I have to, she didn't tell me. That's a big deal, okay? Um, and I, I end the, la the last part of the book simply telling my old friends, you know what, guys? You're probably gonna have to say a lot more about what it is we do. Don't pretend it's not gonna hurt. Don't pretend it's not gonna shave points off of effectiveness, okay? Uh, but these good folks here aren't gonna let you do it unless they know more about it. Just like a whole bunch of other things with regard to our government, you're no longer willing to outsource your approval and we're just gonna to have to be more open with you. Um, I, I said we're gonna to have to be more transparent. Actually, a good friend of mine, Janine, my wife, reminded me of a word he used a couple of years ago at the Aspen Security Conference, and I said, you're just gonna to have to be more transparent. And he said, Mike, you're right, but I think you're using the wrong word. We need to be more translucent. And that's actually really quite clever. Okay, translucent means I can see the broad shapes. I can see enough that I, that I know the broad outlines of what, what is going on, but I don't, I don't have the fine operational detail. And so that, that, is, that is a massive adjustment that we have to make. One final, one final what now? And, and it is, I'll be very, very brief because I don't know where it goes. Uh, this whole unmasking, Susan Rice, minimization, legal collection, they were wiretapping Trump Tower whatever it's doing for your digestion. <laughs> it is in a way that is irresponsible charging the American intelligence community with using its enormous powers at the, for the service of a domestic political cause. That's awful and it's untrue. And, and just watch this space, all right? because that, that could actually lead to some very, very dark places. I was, when I was director of NSA, I used to, I used to find a saying, to, to be successful, we only need to be two things, secretive and powerful. And we exist inside of a political culture that frankly distrusts only two things, secrecy and power. And now, but we get the hall pass. We get the hall pass because we are and always have been apolitical. If in any way, shape or form, we are tarred now with a tool of a political element, it's, it is the kiss of death for American espionage. So I, I talked about um, uh, my class, George Mason, Essential Two, and all that. Let me, let me end on that point, and then we'll get to the, all, all the questions you might want to ask. Uh, one of the great delights of my second life and with Janine with me is we get to come and talk to folks like yourself, and we get to invite, we get, we get invited to a whole bunch of other things, too. So we got invited, for example, to the Corcoran Gallery down in, on 17th Street in DC. Um, for the Washington premiere of episode one of season two of Homeland. <laughs> okay. And so we, we saw it and I, I, got, I got to walk up to Mandy Patinkin in, in, the, in the after show party and walked up and say, hi, Mr. Patinkin, I'm Mike Hayden. I used to play the director of CIA too. <laughs> <laughs> we got to go to another premiere. This one for far less famous show. Um, I think it's AMC, uh, called Turn. It's about the culprit spy ring. Some, some folks are nodding. Yeah. It's about the culprit spy ring on Long Island during the revolution. Okay? Um, and so we got invited. We saw episode one, season one. It's, it's been renewed. I think they're in the season three, four? Yeah. Four, season four. It's getting a little more fantastical, a little further away from the historical narrative as they got to build another season after another season. But the first one was obviously dramatized, but pretty close to Culper. I mean, the Culper, Culper was the ring Washington set up on Long Island to spy on the British in New York. All right? It's a classic American espionage story. So I get to be on the panel afterwards. And I'm sitting, sitting at the panel in, uh, in, in the auditorium. And it's me, the historian on whose work the screenplay had been based, an actor or two, and I, the producer or director. And we're just having a conversation. Finally, the moderator says, well, you're, you're the only real spy on stage. What did you think of it? I said, oh, I, I really enjoyed it. This is great. Really? Well, why? I said, it showed Culper, 
Washington. It showed that American espionage is as old as the Republic, that this is baseball and apple pie, that the nation's first spy master was the nation's first president. Oh, by the way, when he became president, he insisted on a covert action budget, which makes us 45 for 45 right now on presidents wanting to be able to do covert action. Right? And I, I went through my whole shtick about not just compatible with, but essential to American democracy. And I was delighted to be able to say that with the backdrop of American history, with, the, with an audience like yourself there. Oh yeah, where were we? We were in the auditorium of the uh, National Archives. And I got to say that essential to, not just compatible with line, about 135 feet from the Constitution and about 145 feet from a copy of the Magna Carta. I am serious about the thematic essential to American security and liberty. And with that, I will stop and happily take any questions. students. So if you have questions, if you're a student, please come down to one of the microphones, get into the line. Uh, and second, and this applies to everyone, students, non-students, and everything in between, please be brief. No speeches and no multi-part questions. So. Sure. Uh, hello, thank you for coming out today. Uh, my question concerns the reports of leaking that's been going on um, within CIA, NSA, the the executive branch in general of some of these intelligence reports. Could you talk a little bit about why you think there's been an uptick, at least in yeah. my sense, there seems to be been an uptick so, in- So you're asking about the, the disclosure of masses amount of information by someone who has stolen them, which is kind of the um, Snowden file seven <coughs> episode, or are you talking about Mike Flynn's name being made public? The Mike Flynn. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, I, I'd offer you the view. I'm gonna challenge the premise of your question, all right? Uh, that's intelligence information. That is not prima facie evidence in any way, shape, or form that it's being leaked by intelligence people, all right? In fact, I, I think the smart money in Washington is that the Flynn name is leaked by one or another faction in what is a very factionalized White House, not from the intelligence community. And so, so as, as director, you know, we would go down and brief somebody on something really, really kind of close hold, both on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, right? And then about you know, a day or two later, I'm in there with my deputy, Steve Kappas, and got CNN on and go, ooh. And turn to him and say, oh, that didn't take very long, did it? And, and, and so there's a, there's a saying in Washington that the ship of state is the only ship that leaks from the top. <laughs> So, so don't, do not presume, as many do in this very dark news coverage of all this, that it is, it is the dark state, the intelligence apparatus making war on a successful operational act, all right, in which terrorists have taken off the battlefield. And at the end of the, I just I just mentioned it. it wasn't the core of the meeting. It was about something else. But we had everyone there. I told them. So I'm getting up, ready to go, throwing stuff in a bag, and, and I get shoved in the back. And it's Rahm Emanuel, all right? And so you, you must know Rahm. So, so, so Rahm says to me, tell your guys good stuff, Aiden. You know, he didn't have to do that. I, I really appreciate it. So, so I had the thought, Rahm Emanuel was nice to me. Back away from the room. Slowly leave the room. Pocket, pocket the compliment. But I actually had the conscious thought, I'm not going to talk to these guys ever again. I'm leaving. This is my last week. Rom, thanks, that was really kind. But you realize that's a counterterrorism success. Unless you change the facts on the ground, we get to kill people forever. And that's, somebody mentioned it, it's seen the, the gatekeepers, right? That's the complaint of the Shin Bet chiefs who said, we have done your heavy lifting for 30 years. It was designed to create the time and the space for you to solve the problem. This could never be the resolution. And the Shin Bet chiefs were feeling a sense of betrayal that their political masters had not used the time and space they had created. And frankly, we at CIA have the same, you know, you can probably tell, I told you, the book's not apologetic. I told you it was very successful. It did exactly what we told the president it was going to do. But we never told the president it was going to make Al-Qaeda go away. 
And that can only be done with these more long-term things that um, we haven't adequately addressed. Yeah, thanks. We have time for one more question. Okay, there it is, sir. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so earlier in the lecture, you talked about the Madisonian system as posing an effective check on potential abuses of the 215 program and other surveillance activities. But in more recent years, information has come out about Jim Clapper giving an accurate testimony to Congress yeah. or a 99.9% FISA court acceptance rate of uh, these warrant requests. So to what extent do you think that this Madisonian system is actually functioning yeah. robust? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, obviously I'm betraying my background, but yeah, it's, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so let me talk about Jim. All right. This is Clapper in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee a couple years ago, open session on, I think it was a worldwide threat briefing, so it wasn't about this. And Ron Wyden says to him, uh, General, I'm, I'm, I'll get the words wrong, but the gist is right. Uh, General, does NSA collect any information in bulk on millions of Americans? And Jim responds, no, Senator, certainly not intentionally. All right. Now, now. If you know the 215 program, eh, A, and A, A and B don't, don't fit very well together, all right? Uh, and, and Jim's answer was wrong and, and clumsy. Not evil, not attempting to lie, just wrong and clumsy. Now, the backdrop, okay? Wyden knows everything there is to know about the 215 program. Everybody on that dais knows everything there is to know about the 215 program. Everybody behind everybody on that dais, all the staffers, know everything there is to know about the 215 program. Wyden's explicit purpose was to track, trap Clapper into revealing a program that Wyden opposed that remained classified. And the reason that Wyden was so vocal about supporting the program, about trying to hammer the program, that the senator was losing the votes in the committee 13 to 2 on trying to limit the program. So there's a, you know, Jim was wrong. He shouldn't have answered it that way. But there is, a, there is a whole backstory here that actually puts an awful lot of extenuation out there. On, on the FISA approval rate, um, it's not 99.9, .9, but it's high, all right? But uh, I, I gotta tell you, the FISA, you have to go to court. If, if, you, want, if you want to target um, anyone that's called a US person, that's an American anywhere in the world, or frankly, anyone in America, all right? So for example, Sergei Kisoyak, the Russian ambassador, <clears throat> he's a US person, okay? He enjoys the protection of the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution because he's a legal permanent resident of the United States. And so if we were ever to want to intercept his communications, and I don't know if we've ever done anything like that, okay? If we ever wanted to intercept his communications, we would have to go to a court and prove that he is an agent of a foreign power. Not an especially heavy lift for the Russian ambassador, but... <laughs> It, frankly, it's, it's about that thick. And, and so it, it is a heavily cumbersome bureaucratic process. And my life experience is, at the end of the day, you get almost all of them approved, but a whole bunch of them are not approved right away. And I, I, don't, I don't mean they just say, well, come back later. It's, uh, really? I don't think so. Or, or, or your window is too big, all right? They, yeah, I'm not so sure he uses all those phones. So uh, what phone does he use primarily? which one of these phones is used by his wife. I mean, you, you, get, the, you get the pressure. And, and so what happens in the dialogue, at the end of the day, if you really think he's an agent of a foreign power, you're, gonna get, you're probably gonna get the court to approve it. But it takes a lot longer than you think. It is heavily bureaucratized. A lot of hands touch it. And very often, it's back again and again and again uh, for, for approval. By the way, right? remember I told you, the president did this, the, the Congress now has oversight committees, and we've got courts. Right? Got that? Right? Hipsy, sissy, House Intelligence, Senate Intelligence, FISA Court. Okay? There is no other Western democracy that has that. We, in, in the 1970s, we took something that has traditionally been the pure reserve of the executive and spread oversight of it into the legislative and the judicial branch. France doesn't do that. England doesn't do that, Great Britain. Australia doesn't do that. Canada doesn't do that. Our oversight committees are more invasive than any parliamentary. I used to have European parliamentarians come to NSA to complain about NSA. And, and my normal greeting was, yeah, I know why you're here, because you don't know anything about what your services do, because you're not allowed to know. We had a, 
we, we, uh, we, we, we have facilities that we share with partners. All right? I had a congressman visit another country where we had a joint facility. He said, I want to go, I want to go to, I want to go there. We said, you can't. I mean, I can't. I'm on the House Intelligence Committee. Of course I can. No, you can't. Why not? We got one of these in the US, and I went there not more than a month ago. Why can't I go here? And the answer was, because no parliamentarian in this Western democracy has ever been allowed to go there. And we can't possibly let an American congressman go. So I, I, get, I, get, I get the concerns. We all, we all share the same political culture. We're all distrustful of secrecy and power. And we may want to make it better. And I already told you about being more translucent. But you need to keep in mind that, that if we want to make it more open, if we want more invasive oversight, if we want more checks and balances, the line of departure that from which we will be leaving is the most invasive, comprehensive system of checks and balances in the democratic world. So, thank you.